So I want to welcome our audience. My name is Kelly O'Brien, and I lead both the Alliance for Regional Development and the Chicago Central Area Committee. If you're not familiar with our work, the Alliance uh, really looks to uh, work on cross-jurisdictional collaboration between the Milwaukee, Chicagoland, Northwest Indiana Corridor. And the Chicago Central Area Committee was created in 1956, and it really addresses planning and development in Chicago. We started this webinar series back in probably early April, end of March, in response to COVID and trying to get uh, real-time information to our members and stakeholders. And it has evolved into this continued webinar series where we rebranded this uh, June 1st to be consistent with the summit that we have planned for um, November 16th with the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And uh, we're still working out the logistics. It will probably be online and we will maybe have the programming throughout the week of November 16th. So stay tuned on that. But for now, we're very pleased uh, to welcome John Barella. And John is the CEO of the Borderplex Alliance. John and I have been in communication for a number of years at this point because it's really helpful to speak to an executive that works on um, three different states. And he often teases me, you know, you think you have it rough. Try, uh, try uh, New Mexico, a state in the country of Mexico, and Texas. So I, I do have to give credit where credit is due, John. You probably do have a little bit of a higher barrier, although uh, regional economic development is challenging on its best day. For our audience, I think it's important to note um, that John served as New Mexico's Economic Development Cabinet Secretary. He was responsible for New Mexico becoming the number one state in export expansion and for creating more than 16,000 jobs. He has worked in the private sector at Intel and as an attorney, educated at Georgetown. I'm a George Washington University girl. <laughs> that DC thing in common. Yeah. And I also want to note to the audience that during one of our previous visits, you were kind enough to send me a great book, um, really helping to link the great state of Illinois and one of our previous presidents with um, part of the work that you do with Mexico. So John, uh, is there anything about your background that you would like the audience to know that I missed? No, you introduced me very, very nicely, Kelly. Thank you. Well, thank you. So uh, there's a, a lot of interest in the work that you do and particularly what's happening now with manufacturing and onshoring. But let's start by helping the audience understand Borderplex and the organization itself and the work that you do kind of day in and day out. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction. I can't tell you how delighted I am to be with all of you in the Chicagoland area. I will at the outset say that uh, those of us in the Borderplex region feel a tighter connection to Chicago than places like Phoenix and Denver and Albuquerque. I'll explain why in my presentation, but uh, for those uh, of you who are on the line, Kelly's absolutely right. There are a lot of parallels between the CCAC and the Borderplex Alliance. To my knowledge, the Borderplex Alliance is the only privately funded organization that represents three states and two countries. We define the Borderplex region as Ciudad Juarez, El Paso County, and my home county of Doniana County, New Mexico, Las Cruces. So I'm very proud to be a native of this region, and it's a unique place. I uh, love living here, love being from here, and uh, the weather's always pretty much great here, so it's <laughs> thrilling to be here. Well, and I know you visited our uh, area when it's the dead of winter, and so we appreciate that your interest in our area. And we do have, I think, a, a, an important relationship and even stronger bridges to build. Absolutely. And uh, I love Chicago. I always gravitated when I was at Georgetown to the guys from Chicago. So uh, I had housemates. Pretty much the whole house was uh, Chicago people. Very, very cool place. So uh uh, literally and figuratively sometimes, but uh, I, <laughs> no I, pun intended. Yeah, I, I, I love the people from Chicago. Very, very neat place to be. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about Borderplex. 
Well, the Borderplex Alliance is a, a very interesting and unique organization, as I said. We are the policy advocacy and economic development group for this entire region. The region itself is comprised of 2.6 to 2.7 million individuals. And while by comparison to the Chicagoland area, if you were to place our metro area into the United States, it would be the 19th largest metropolitan area in the country. So it's a sizable metro area, and we are indeed one integrated economy, one integrated region. We're com we are certainly connected through history and culture, and you really can't tell where one city ends and the other begins. It's a very unique place. Uh, 30, 15 to 30% of our retail trade is in fact from uh, Mexican national shopping in the US. And while that's dropped significantly during the COVID crisis, frankly, we did not have the uh, problem of bricks and mortar. Uh, malls are always full here. Uh, strip malls are always full because of the Mexican shoppers. So it's a very dynamic regional economy. And prior to the COVID crisis, the unemployment rate in El Paso County was at 3.4%. And the unemployment rate in Ciudad Juarez was 2% according to government statistics. And that's a far cry from uh, where things were when I was growing up as a kid. And a lot of that, uh, we uh, certainly credit to uh, the NAFTA agreement and our connection to the region like yours. Uh, we all were in this together creating jobs. John, when was Borderplex established? We were established uh, six years ago. So we're a relatively new organization. It was an amalgamation of two entities here in El Paso. We combined efforts, uh, but we also brought in our partners in Ciudad Juarez and the economic development partners in Doniana County. So we work closely with our Mexican counterparts and our New Mexico counterparts. It's a, a very nice uh, orderly uh, transition that we had pretty much. Uh, but right now we're working very, very well together. We realize that as a region, we have to work together in order to move our collective economies forward. And do you have um, state and local government? I know you're privately funded, but do you have the support and involvement from state and local government? We do, we have a variety of memoranda of understandings from uh, these political jurisdictions and some of the partners that we have, for example, uh, the Hispanic Chambers of Commerce, uh, the Greater Chambers of Commerce in all these areas. We have these memoranda of understanding, these MOUs, which clearly delineate what our role is and what, uh, how we support them in their roles. Uh, we do not accept, as a rule, government money. There are exceptions that we have made in the past, but we deliberately try to avoid accepting uh, money, especially from the local governments here in this area. And John, what kind of feedback have you received from your private sector members in terms of the value and the interest in being a part of the Borderplex Alliance? Well, we're lucky to have some great members. Uh, again, private sector leaders, uh, thought leaders, community leaders that are part of our organization, uh, representat representation uh, that's uh, on par uh, in parity with uh, the population in Mexico, population in New Mexico. So uh, we're thrilled to have, uh, have that kind of involvement. It's absolutely vital. And how is your organization adjusted with COVID in terms of, I assume, you're not having in-person meetings any longer, meeting on Zoom or other virtual platforms? Sadly, we have not had any virtual meetings. We, as you know, there are three, the three different political jurisdictions have taken a, a different approach toward this COVID crisis, curiously, probably like your area with the tri-state region that you're in. Uh, New Mexico is very tight right now. I uh, wouldn't say it's locked down. It's opening up a little bit, but not as wide open as Texas. And uh, Ciudad Juarez is somewhere in between. So uh, uh, the state of Chihuahua, the federal government is really in Mexico. It's very centralized. So the mandates and the edicts typically come from uh, Mexico City. You, um, you cut out there for just a second, John, so maybe you can repeat. I lost you after you said that New Mexico is not quite locked down, but it's tight. And then you went on to say, I know Texas is really experiencing a spike right now. Yeah, it's experiencing a spike. Uh, Texas is 
pretty much wide open, of course, with some uh, provisions uh, of safety. Um, every, every business now, at least in El Paso, you have to wear a mask as you enter the business, but most businesses are wide open with limitations uh, of capacity, certainly. Um, and you probably missed that Ciudad Juarez is somewhere in between New Mexico and Texas. And that in uh, Mexico, many of the edicts, the health edicts, are coming from Mexico City's federal government. Okay. And so tell me how manufacturing has slowed in Mexico, or has, has there been any interruptions because of COVID? Well, it has. And one of the key things, let me take a step back and explain. Our region is the fifth largest manufacturing hub in North America. Uh, we are behind Chicago. Chicago is the second largest manufacturing hub in terms of employment. We're number five. When you combine the 300 or so, we have 300,000 people involved in manufacturing operations, many of which are connected to the supply chain of Chicago uh, businesses and Illinois businesses. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, trade the connection between Illinois and Mexico is very, very close. According to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, well over 230,000 jobs in Illinois rely directly on trade with Mexico. It's your second largest trade partner behind Canada. But of the top five trade partners that Illinois has, trade since 2009 with Mexico and Illinois uh, has increased 178%. $10 billion worth of export and import uh, opportunities every single year occur between Illinois and the Republic of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Illinois and Mexico has a trade balance when you include the service sector. So there's no trade deficit. And that's what I was alluding to earlier. Uh, the U.S. side of the border, too, has these very, very close trading connections to Illinois companies as part of that supply chain, whether it be in electronics, aviation, or automotive manufacturing. So our region, that's why I say our region feels closer to Chicago than, than again, cities that are much closer, like Phoenix and Albuquerque and Denver, much closer trading relationship with your area. And that's why uh, I'm happy to be here today. Well, John, that's exactly why I wanted um, you to be here today, because I think it's important for our stakeholders to understand how important the relationship is. And I think um, that you have a video that you wanted to share to help our okay. audience you know, have some visuals about your, um, what we call the mega region here, which is our Milwaukee, Chicago, and Northwest Indiana corridor. Um, would, would you like to show that now? I'd be, I'd be very, very happy to. All right, excellent. I know we have some support um, from the Alliance team. Maybe we can gin up the video. where Texas, New Mexico, and Mexico triumphantly come together. This is where El Paso, Las Cruces, and Juarez are one. Momentum is huge, business is booming, multiple highway expansions, and the flow of products and exchange of ideas is never ending. Here you find the versatility, productivity, and fluidity of a strong bilingual and binational workforce. We have the fourth largest manufacturing hub in North America, accounting for 17% of all trade with Mexico, and over 70 Fortune 500 companies call our region home. We're fast becoming one of the most critical trade centers along the U.S.-Mexico border. Three cities, one region, one shared vision. Welcome to El Paso, Juarez, and Las Cruces. Welcome to the intersection of possibilities. That's great, John, and it's, um, you really should be proud of that video. It, it really certainly is a chamber-worthy um, uh, showcase of, of the beautiful towns that are a part of, of the, your daily work. Yes, thank you. One, one real quick point of uh, clarification, parenthetically, uh, we are the fifth largest. I know the video says fourth largest. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we were eclipsed by uh, uh, New York, uh, New Jersey area. So uh, they're fourth and we're fifth. So just a point of clarification. Uh, well, so and I think um, we have a slide also that kind of shows the ranking. Maybe we, Alliance staff can put that up. 
Well, while I have that on, if I could just real quickly, one thing that we're very proud of uh, before we get to the manufacturing hub, there was one slide here that we were starting with safety. Uh, thanks to pop culture and certainly a political discourse, sometimes not so civil, El Paso is often portrayed as a violent, lawless frontier. And that's just not the truth. Just recently, we uh, in El Paso, we're always proud of being consistently uh, one of the top five safest big cities in America. Here in El Paso, we have almost a million individuals. And we came in fifth just two weeks ago, FBI statistics, the fifth safest large city in America. We are thrilled to be able to brag about that. We came in second. We're the second safest city when it comes to property crime. Uh, so we're, we're just extremely proud. We want a myth bust about you know, how people perceive us as being this violent, lawless frontier. It's anything but that. So it's always the elephant in the room when we talk about people, uh, talk to people and their immediate perceptions of our region. Uh, we're extremely proud of, of our crime and safety statistics. Yes, but well, there, was, there was a slide there that shows the top uh, metro areas in the country for uh, manufacturing. And there you can go. see that right there. Uh, and you see for Chicago is number two, but we're, we're, we're not too far behind San Diego, Tijuana. We've been closing very quickly. A few years ago, we were not in the top five, certainly. Uh, we we're barely in the top 10. So our region's climbing extremely quickly uh, for a variety of reasons. Well, I think your leadership, honestly, is, is certainly a major factor. And speaking of um, your leadership, how are you looking at positioning the Border Plex um, Alliance as there is the discussion of onshoring? After we realized after COVID, the necessity to be producing important um, products like PPE and the different chemicals for our medications, how are, how are you thinking about repositioning given the, the new normal? Well, when I was cabinet secretary in New Mexico, uh, one of the first speeches I remember giving, uh, I, I boldly proclaimed that the Chinese manufacturing experiment was doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, even back then, hundreds of thousands of jobs were being reshored to North America uh, under the guise of then NAFTA. China back then had many issues. I saw it firsthand at Intel. Among those issues was uh, rising labor costs and in unpredictable transportation and logistics system, uh, clogging at the port of Long Beach and LA, for example, uh, high utility costs, uh, quality issues, and now most importantly, an unpredictable political system. This is pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, now that we are in the COVID world and as we transition to the post-COVID world, I think the reshoring of Chinese uh, jobs will absolutely spike. We're seeing it now. Anecdotally, uh, as slow as things are in our region and the economy, even though things are picking up, we're at an all-time high uh, in terms of vetted projects in our region. Uh, many of those projects are, in fact, uh, domestic firms, North American firms, European firms are looking to reshore their jobs from China to our region and to North America. So we're in the running for many projects. No surprise, uh, medical device, PPEs uh, are, are certainly part of the equation, but so is automotive and so is aviation uh, and aerospace related uh, uh, activities. So I'm sure your region may start seeing, or if it hasn't already, we'll start seeing the equivalent uh, activity. I think you're going to see that throughout our country. We happen to, however, believe that our region is perfectly positioned to take advantage of those reshoring opportunities. We do have lower labor costs. We're strategically located uh, right in the middle of the 2,000-mile border, east and west, north and south of the new U.S. MCA countries. Uh, and I, for one, am bullish on the future, not only for the American economy, but certainly for our economy. And we are doing everything we can right now to position ourselves as being the gateway of trade for the Americas. And we are experiencing some success. Uh, we're gonna be, uh, hopefully, God willing, uh, pushing a few projects over the finish line here in the next couple of weeks. 
uh, and we're thrilled uh, about the future. And I'm, I'm, I'm being very optimistic about that, not only for our region, but for your region, because we have, again, this symbiotic relationship. What a job created in our region ought to be a job created in the Chicagoland area and vice versa, the way I see it. So uh, the symbiotic ties that we have between us and you is, is, may not be apparent to a lot of folks, but it's absolutely there. I want to make sure that the audience um, knows that there is a question and answer button, a Q&A. Please feel free to submit any of your questions for John. And building on what you just referenced, um, I have been a big believer in looking at our supply chains and figuring out how we can do a better job of connecting the dots within the USA, within our region specifically, and then with regions that are really robust like yours. Any thoughts on how we might be able to tackle a project like that? Well, I think we need to communicate like we are right now and stay in touch uh, and share uh, reshoring opportunities as they come up. Uh, I also think we need to be focused on policy issues like we did before. You know, uh, for those of you who are listening to this, uh, we linked arms with uh, the, uh, we linked arms, it was about two years ago, right, Kelly, that we first met? Probably. And we were really talking about uh, the, the two, two regions and uh, how the CCAC and our organization need to link arms on getting the USMCA passed. Um, after all, uh, it, it, it's six million American jobs rely on that. And in the Midwest, 800,000 jobs or so rely on direct, directly on trade with Mexico. So the fact that we got USMCA done and working on these policy issues was absolutely vital to get done. So I see it not only on the business to business uh, opportunities, but we need to continue working on these policy issues because we're still gonna see a very fluid amount of activity when it comes to trade policies, uh, not only with uh, uh, China, but other parts of the world. John, for our audience, can you help um, the audience understand the differences between NAFTA and the USMCA and maybe some of the benefits that both of our regions should be looking at? USMCA uh, is a tremendous improvement over the old North American Free Trade Agreement. The US-Mexico-Canada Agreement, USMCA, was overdue. Uh, NAFTA was 25 years old. Uh, needed updating. So uh, the area that I think where both regions will benefit most directly will be in the auto content and minimum wage uh, provisions of the new USMCA. 70% um, are there, 60 to 70%, it gets a little technical, I won't go into all the details, of auto content those parts that go into manufacturing an automobile must be made now in North America. So the loophole that existed for Chinese and other Asian uh, parts to come in uh, has pretty much been eliminated. So that means more suppliers will be moving. Even again, pre-COVID, we saw this activity. More suppliers will be moving into our respective regions, uh, I believe. And Secondly, the, the, there is a now a $16 wage requirement uh, for the manufacture of parts and supplies and automobiles, which will also help the reshoring opportunities uh, for the United States. Um, this should also help Canada. So uh, I, I think all three countries uh, will benefit. One provision that's very curious that not many people know about uh, is a um, provision affecting China. Uh, each respective country, and this was mainly aimed at Mexico, uh, has to give notice if they are going to enter into a trade agreement with China. I won't get, I go into all the details, but uh, that gives us notice uh, that the U.S. notice that uh, this might happen. And there are provisions that will essentially make it difficult for uh, Mexico to do that. The reason I say this and, and, and I know that, again, pop culture and politics, as I said before, portrays Mexico in a very negative light. They have their issues. I'm not going to sugarcoat some of the things that are going on there. But I'm going to state emphatically that Mexico is a strategic and economic ally of the United States. It is not a foe. And don't you know that China has been chomping at the bit to try to figure out a way to get into Mexico in a much larger strategic and economic way, as they are doing in other parts of Latin America.
So that's why I say we've got to continue to stay on top of this and and and, and always uh, always adapt. But the U.S. those are some basic provisions of USMCA. Of course, there's a chapter now on e-commerce, which didn't exist 25 years ago. Uh, so it, it, it's a vastly, uh, uh, it's a big improvement. We have a few audience questions coming in. So I would like to read the first one. And it reads, how specifically do you best attract reshoring opportunities to your region? How do you help your companies connect with potential foreign partners? Well, what we've done most recently, and I have to uh, credit my staff, we've come up with two very, in this COVID world, travel now is, is gone uh, pretty much. And um, I, I always compliment my staff. I have a very gifted staff and they adapted very quickly to two platforms that we use to micro target industries that are looking to do either do foreign direct investment in our region or simply looking to expand or relocate in our region. And these two platforms are very powerful and they've had some very good early results. And we've been using these effectively since uh, really March uh, when this COVID crisis began. So I'm very proud of their uh, creativity and, and uh, pivot toward how we market this region. And so I'm very happy about that. And of course, we do it the traditional way too of the old relationships that we have when it comes to attract attraction in this region. Um, likewise, when we have a company, and we have done this in the past, when we have a company that's uh, here uh, that wants uh, to expand its opportunities uh, uh, for other investments in, in, in business, we help them with that as well through a variety of, of, of mechanisms. But um, uh, our major job is to get jobs here um, and to try to connect our uh, companies with uh, other companies, especially suppliers and the like. So uh, that's a, it's a huge part of what we do. Sure, we thank you. We have an, another question and it reads, what are the cross region trade numbers for agriculture and food products between the Alliance region and the Borderplex regions? What are the Borderplex goals for those sectors? Well, so I have to admit, I don't, they're asking from my, from our region, I don't have those handy. I don't know, John, if you do. Well, uh, I do have a list of, of value added food production in Illinois. I don't have the Chicago numbers, uh, but, but uh, in Illinois, um, the trade with Mexico, uh, it's not in the top five sectors of value added food production. Probably no surprise. Uh, and I can't answer the question. I don't know uh, right offhand what that entails from uh, the Chicago area uh, to, to Mexico. I know that value-added food production is a very big part of our economy. We have a large agricultural sector in the Mesilla Valley, uh, which is Las Cruces, and uh, all kinds of, of products are, are traded, uh, uh, especially cattle, for example, uh, here in the region. And a, a large number of um, uh, food processors have set up business here in our region. Most recently, Stampede Meat. Uh, which created about a thousand jobs in Southern Doniana County, uh, well-paying jobs. Uh, and we've got a, a large cold storage uh, growth industry here uh, that uh, we see continuing very strongly. Well, you, for the person that um, asked that question, we can certainly get our hands on that information and send it back to you. I know right now the Alliance is looking at the drivers of the uh, mega region economy, which again is the Milwaukee, Chicagoland, Northwest Indiana, and in some cases the Midwest a a as a whole, looking at the drivers, really understanding how they have been impacted by COVID, and then you know really figuring out what um, what attention and resources can be addressed to to make some you know give the assistance that's needed. But in terms of it's an interesting question because obviously we're also um, very ag, uh, you know, very strong ag sector. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would assume, uh, and I don't know this, uh, I'm just speculating that uh, clearly most of the agricultural products, uh, value added food production probably takes place between your region and Canada, I would imagine, especially with the dairy products, uh, I would think, maybe some cattle, uh, certainly grains, 
uh, and the trade with the grain industry. I would think that that's true. Uh, that I don't know, but I can tell you, and I don't know the numbers, is that Mexico imports a lot of grain. Speaking of which, from uh, uh, the Midwest, and I'm sure uh, in southern Illinois, uh, is a big, big uh, producer of some of those uh, those exports to Mexico. So I can't believe this, but the 30 minutes has already come and gone. So while we um, wrap up, John, is there any last points that you would like our audience to hear about how, again, we can do a better job of figuring out how we can work together so that both of our economies uh, can benefit? Well, I hope when this post-COVID world uh, uh, passes, or the, the current COVID world passes and we enter into a, a period where we can meet face to face. Love to have some reciprocal uh, presentations, uh, live presentations uh, and in-depth presentations about what our respective regions can do and how we can introduce businesses uh, in both regions to uh, opportunities in, in a mutual way to create jobs in your region and in ours. And that's what I would like to do moving forward, Kelly. And of course, stay in touch on all of these policy issues because it's going to be, a, as you know, a very rapidly changing political environment one way or the other of these national elections. And we have to stay on top of trade issues and uh, other border related issues. So, um, you know, I, I look forward to the continuing relationship with the CCAC, with you and, and your members. And uh, you're always welcome down here. Your members are always welcome down here. And I look forward to some face-to-face -face, uh, uh, presentation, seminars, uh, whatever we think will be most effective. Well, thank you. And I look forward to hosting you again back up here in our mega region. And I do think that we are living in a very interesting days and the opportunities are ripe, um, particularly for the reshoring. And I, you know, both of our um, mega regions can benefit. And that's, we have to get away from the mentality of a win-lose and that's really right. get on the idea that there are ways that we can all benefit by really understanding to enhancing these connections. So with that, I'm going to um, sign off and I want to thank our audience for dialing in today. Our next webinar will be on Thursday at our regular time, which is 1.30 p.m. Central Time. We're thrilled to have um, the leader of the Indiana Economic Development Corporation joining us to talk about Governor Holcomb's, uh, how he's supporting businesses and how Indiana is continuing to to grow their business community even during COVID. So that's gonna be a great conversation, don't miss it. And I just wish everyone stay well, stay strong. And John, I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Likewise, thank you again. It's an honor to be here today. Our honor, thank you so much. Bye everybody, have a great day. Bye-bye.